Brothers and sisters, I encourage yourselves and myself to fear Allah, as it is the foundation of the faith. Of all of the deeds that we are commanded to do, without taqwa, those deeds mean nothing. Those deeds become sins on our scale of evil deeds on the Day of Judgment. So I ask Allah SWT to help us to achieve taqwa in this life, to protect our life to come. Today, I would like to address the balance. Finding that balance in our lives. We of the 21st century see our lives so busy we don't have time to remember Allah. Most of our time is caught up in work, electronics, traveling, transportation. Very little is left after that. We know how much time the television takes up from our lives. How many hours every day spent on our mobiles? Then where do we find time beyond the basic five daily prayers to remember Allah? So that that remembrance would impact on our lives and we would find the peace about which Allah spoke in the Quran, Allah bi dhikrillahi it is only with the remembrance of Allah that the hearts find rest. How do we get there when there is no time? Will Allah be understanding and excuse us that what was required of the generations before us was possible because they had time. We don't have any time today. Actually, the world has not changed. Yes, technology has, but human life is still the same way it was in the past, and the same way it will be until Yom al -Qiyam. That's why Islam is for all times. Because once we start to go back and say, well, that was the time of the Sahaba, they had this and they had that, they could do, they could do, we can't, then we're saying Islam is not good for our time. And of course, that's misguidance. Reality is that back in the time of the Sahaba, one of them, by the name of Handala, ended up in the street in a state of confusion, shouting, Handala has become a munafiq. A munafiq, a fake Muslim. One who may be Muslim on the outside, but a disbeliever on the inside. He was wandering through the streets, re repeating this. Hanzala has become Abu Nafi. Till he bumped into Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr asked him, what's going on? What's happened? Allah said, when I sit with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he speaks about Jannah and the hellfire, it is as if I could see it. As if I was there with him. My imams complete. But as soon as I get home, my wife, 
my children. They distract me to such a degree that I forget. As if my faith is gone. That consciousness, awareness is no longer there. Abu Bakr said, that's the same thing that happens to me too. So he joined Hamdallah, saying Abu Bakr has become a munafiq. Walking along with Hamdallah, as Hamdallah says, Hamdallah has become a munafiq. Abu Bakr says, Abu Bakr has become a munafiq. Repeating each other as they walk down the streets. Till they were called to Rasulullah sallallahu They went to Rasulullah sallallahu and he asked them, what's the problem? What's, what's the issue? So they explained to him. And he smiled. And he said, if you were able to remain in the state you are when you are with me, when you are not with me, when you go back home to your family, if you were able to remain as you were with me, the angels would give you salams, shaking your hands whilst you're in the bed. Whilst you lay down at bed at night, the angel would come and shake your hand. Salam alaikum. Paradise is yours. He said, life has some of this and some of that. That is the reality. It is about finding that balance. That we don't become so engrossed in this life that we forget the hereafter. Or that we become so focused on the hereafter that we forget this life. And there are many stories from the Prophet ﷺ in which he addressed this danger of extreme religiosity and extreme dunya. And he didn't leave this world without giving us a program a way of life, a manhaj, that would handle that balance, that would provide that balance in our lives. And it is not complex philosophy that we have to enter into to find it. It's not hidden in the depths of hadith which are rarely quoted, only few people have access to it and only the sheikh of my sheikh found out. No. The Prophet ﷺ left this world and left us as Aisha said, ala mahajjatin bayla. That we are left on a clear white plain whose day is like its night. And anyone who deviates from it is destroyed. But he left a clear white plain. Day and night are like the same. He left it with two principles. Kitabullah wa sunnati. As he said, you hold on firmly to them, you will never go astray. You will be on that plane. You will find the balance with the Book of Allah and the Sunnah. The Book of Allah provides the essence of the Deen. The Sunnah is the dunya. The sunnah is the Prophet ﷺ living the Quran, living that deed in this world. So it is about 
attaching ourselves to the Quran in the fullest sense, in the true sense, not in the sense that we have attached ourselves today. The way in which we have attached ourselves to the Quran today is far different from the way the companions, the first generation, attached itself. And the Tabi'in, those who came after them. We have a different attachment. Our attachment today is on the surface. The text. The ritual regarding the text. So that reading the text Memorizing the text becomes the most important thing. Understanding the text, very few people understand. But Allah clearly said, Quran." Will they not reflect? on the meanings of the Qur'an and understand the Qur'an so they can implement it in their life? Am ala qulubin akfaluha? Or are their hearts locked up? This is the status of most Muslims in the world today. Hearts locked up from the Qur'an. But holding on very firmly to that text, putting it on the highest place possible, Treating it very specially, wrapping it in special wrappings, kissing it if it falls on the ground, putting it on top of their heads before reading it. All kinds of rituals which have no basis in the sunnah, but have become the norm today. But at the same time, with that norm, we have gone astray. The Ummah has strayed from the Quran. So now we resemble the ayah in Surah Al Furqan, in which Allah said, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّي إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا The Messenger said, O oh my Lord, my people have abandoned this Quran. We resemble that. We are living that. Abandon the Quran. Last year before I went to Canada, a sister called me and asked me what should she do. She said, my son, memorize the whole Quran at the age of 10, they memorized the whole Quran at the age of 10. Prayed, fasted, everything. At the age of 15, he came home on his 15th birthday. He came home and told us that he doesn't believe in Allah. He came home and told the family that he didn't believe in Allah. Muhammad وسلم, was not a messenger of Allah. Islam is made up by people. This is half his Quran. Last year I was in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I was giving a talk at university there, and in the audience, one individual was leading an attack against me. An attack based on my supporting and defense of the Islamic position regards 
regarding homosexuality. That it is a sin, punishable in the Sharia. So he was on this roll wearing a Palestinian scarf and attacking me, Asian background, attacking me. My talk was about Islamization of knowledge. What that has to do with what he's talking about, God only knows. But he was straightforward attack. Later, I was informed that he had been half in Quran. <coughs> he was, as a youth, half in from the Quran. He was now a homosexual defender of homosexuality. And I'm not saying this to say, don't memorize the Quran, because this is what's going to happen to you. Please, don't get that idea. I know people may go home and say, listen, Dr. Bilal said, if you memorize the Quran, you're going to leave Islam. No, this is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there is a disconnect. How could somebody who memorized the whole Quran Disbelieve in Allah. It's possible if you didn't understand a thing that you memorized. That is the consequence. That memorizing the Quran without understanding the Quran will leave you or leave our children unprotected. Weak, unclear, confused. So this practice in Southeast Asia of choosing one of your children to memorize the Quran based on a fabricated hadith that the one who memorizes the Quran will be able to take seven family members with him into Jannah. well circulated hadith. So you'll find families who will de designate you. Your job is to memorize the Quran. The rest of us will deal with business, riba, you know, whatever. We'll cheat, do everything. We'll handle the dunya. You just take care of the Quran. This is misguidance, brothers and sisters. Educate your family to give this up. This is not Islam. It's fake. It's ritual. It's misguidance. And it will not save us from the hellfire. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa insaidu mutubina wa kulli dam fa astaghfiru inna hu huwa al-ghafur rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. The Sahaba used to read the Quran, study the Quran, 10 verses at a time. And they would not go on to the next 10 until they had understood what was in the first 10. And they had striven to implement what was there in the first ten? That was their way. The way of the true believers. That first generation which the Prophet ﷺ promised that they were the best of generations. That should be our goal. To understand the Quran. To live it as the Prophet ﷺ lived it. To implement it in our lives. With that balanced, because the Quran teaches moderation. 
Allah set us on a middle path without extremes in one direction or the other. Implementing the deen as the Prophet ﷺ did. On the other hand, the sunnah of Rasulullah is the guidance for our lives. Most of our lives today are spent at work, eight hours a day, nine hours a day, some people 12 hours a day <coughs> at work. Now the only way that we can find the balance in our work is if we are able to transform our work into a bada. This is the only way. Because there's very little time left after that. We're supposed to sleep eight hours and then we have, you know, so many hours we're eating every day, so many hours we spend in the bathroom and what else is left? So the only way is to transform our work into ibadah. To make sure that our work is pleasing to Allah. That means the job we choose should be halal. That's the beginning point. Should be no doubt about it. If it's not halal, we need to leave it. We need to find another job which is halal. Because otherwise, if our job is halal, our wealth that we are accumulating is, halal, is, is haram. If a job is haram, sorry. And the wealth that we are accumulating from it is haram. We are eating from haram. We are cursed. We become a cursed ummah. Because we don't live in accordance with halal and haram. We just live in accordance with what we see as necessity. So the job needs to be halal. And then once we get the halal job, then the salary we earn must also be halal. The salary we earn must also be halal. Because the work culture encourages people to take haram. I've spoken about this before. The cat and mouse game of work culture. Where the boss is around, everybody's working hard. When the boss is gone, nobody's working hard. That work culture, which I think most of us are caught up in, it's a norm, we've taken it for granted, that's just how it is. When the manager is there, you gotta put on a good show for him. Or her. When the manager is not there, then you don't have to put on any show for anybody. So you just do what you feel like, whenever you feel like, however you feel like. But if we fall into that work culture, then our salary becomes haram. Though the work might be halal, we are not earning halal. Our earning becomes haram because we are taking salary for what we didn't earn. We didn't do the work which was what was required for that salary. So, that is the challenge. For those of us who are in the workplace, this is the big challenge. That we stay working just as if the manager was present. No difference between the presence of the director, the absence of the boss. Because we are working for the sake of Allah. Of course, this will make you an enemy to your workmates. 
all of your other colleagues who are used to that other culture, when they see you working hard and the boss is gone, they're going to say, hey, hey, take it easy. Slow down. It's all right. He's gone. You say, but Allah is still there. Ah, I will do that. You think you are a better Muslim than we are? You fear Allah better than we do? You think you are better? Oh, they start whispering amongst themselves, he's trying to take our job. He wants to get a promotion, he wants to get on top of us and... Now you are the outcast. The true Muslim who works in a way which is pleasing to Allah will become an outcast in today's working world. So that's what you have to be ready for. If you want to find that balance, then you have to be ready to become an enemy to your colleagues at work. Maybe, inshallah, you can influence them, talk to them. That's your da'wah by your actions, by your words, etc. And it may wake them up and change those around you. And maybe not. They will plot and plan and maybe even get you fired. It can go both ways. But know that whatever happens, you have succeeded. Allah blesses what you have earned. He blesses what you have lost. And your reward is Jannah. So brothers and sisters, the balance is there at our reach. We can do it. Put aside this misunderstanding that our lives are too complicated to practice Islam. It's not. The Sunnah guides us in all of the other areas of our spare time, holidays, time with our children, etc., family, etc., time at work, etc. All of that is guided by the Sunnah. Stick with the sunnah and we'll be on Surat al mustaqim With the Quran and the sunnah, we are firmly there. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to awaken us. Awaken us from the slumber, the sleep that we have been locked into these past years, which have left us weakened, unable to worship Allah as He deserves to be worshipped. I ask Allah to forgive what has taken place and to help us change our futures and to give us at the end of this life Jannah. Ameen. Rabbana la tuzib kulubana ba'atil hadaytana wa hablana min رحمة إنك